at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. How are we doing, fellas? Oh, we've just got our year's supply of bloopers all ready to go at the start of the year. So I've only got, I've only got the word fintech behind me. I've got a bit of a reputation to uphold here, fellas. <laughs> Look, we've got no reputation left. That. <laughs> That's all right. Everyone, <laughs> yeah. apologies for the delay. Uh, thank you very much for bearing with us. Uh, as I uh, mentioned a number of times when I was waffling, we're super pumped to have Alex with us today. Um, editor at the IFA, uh, if anyone's not across what they do, you should jump onto their subscription uh, ASAP. But Alex, welcome. Great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. No, it's great. Look, uh, I, I want to jump straight into it. And can you talk to us a little bit? I, I figured no one better to talk about the trends that we're seeing in the industry for someone that's sort of sitting at the centre uh, in the news and, and seeing this stuff every day. So can you give us a bit of an overview on what you're seeing, you know, in the, in the landscape, in the financial advice environment at the moment and some of the trends that are playing out? Yeah, absolutely. So, look, I'd say firstly, it's a, a difficult question um, because when you think about the financial advice industry as kind of a cohesive thing, um, I think that's kind of an old school way of looking at it. There's a number of different trends that are really advanced in really different kind of professional niches uh, within the community. Um, and I think one of the reasons we sort of struggle uh, in this community is because there are some real vested interests that like there to be a such thing as a financial advisor. Um, in, real, in reality, there are different professionals with different specializations, and as such, there are different trends um, that are happening. Uh, for, and that's why, for example, um, at our media company, we believe in narrow casting and in providing uh, you know, niche titles to some of those specializations, whether that be independent and non-aligned advisors, uh, those that are more switched on on the tech side and so on. Um, but generally, having spoken to thousands of advisors here over the last few years and, and also um, gotten a pretty good stock take of what's happening over in the States, I think there are a few trends that those advisors that are doing very well um, professionally uh, and in terms of client engagement are doing. Um, and then there are, of course, some external trends as well. The, the main one that, that everybody listening will be uh, all too aware of um, is that over the last few years, we've seen financial advice, the regulation of financial advice, move from being a fairly um, kind of obscure policy area to being a mainstream political issue. Um, and that is not something that's just happened in Australia. We know the FOFA wars were at times uh, on the front page of the paper. Um, and because of the connections of you know, the various parts of the financial services industry to different political factions, um, it was a very heated subject, um, but it wasn't unique to Australia. In the United States, there's been this similar trend of advisors having to adapt to new regulatory hurdles. Um, uh, the Obama administration, about halfway through its second term, uh, with the Department of Labor, introduced uh, its idea of a fiduciary duty, so basically the equivalent of FOFA's best interest duty for our advisors, um, and they're having their fight there as well. So I'd say the predominant trend over the last few years from Australian financial advisors, unfortunately, has been trying to adapt to the regulatory hoops the government is putting in front of them and still be able to deepen client relationships and turn a profit at the same time. Um, so that's the first trend. Now, in the United States, there is relatively less red tape. Um, and that's why I've been able to identify a few really cool trends that hopefully our advisors here will start to focus on as well. Namely, I think, um, and there are some advisors in Australia who are starting to think this way, who are moving beyond the compliance hurdle, but uh, scalability, I think, is a really important one. How you can reach a greater number of clients in a more cost-effective way without losing engagement, I think that's a really key trend in the years going forward. Um, and also just generally um, embrace of fintech, uh, making the tech providers work for you in a way that is you know, going to um, have mutually beneficial outcomes uh, for both the tech provider and for the, the practice. So I think embracing fintech and working with tech providers, adapting to regulatory change, um, I think they're probably the two key trends. Yep. Okay. 
And I just want to pick up on one of the things that you mentioned at the start there and around, you know, the, the I suppose the difference within the industry of the different types of advisors and advice groups. And, um, you know, you talked about giving them labels uh, around, you know, IFAs or, or different specialists. Do you think, like, what are your thoughts on that? And do you think that it should be clearer, uh, especially for consumers, uh, around the sort of uh, specialists that they're, they're working with? Yeah, look, absolutely. I think, and I think really um, a lot of the industry's problems, I mean, the reason we ended up with FOFA is because of what is perceived to be a conflict within a commission structure. Mm. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there's no conflict in a commission structure unless you don't think that there's a commission involved. So I think a lot of the industry's perception problems that led to all this regulatory nonsense um, was a, it was a disclosure problem that the industry had, not a business model problem uh, and, and there was a tendency for people to not disclose who their licensee was to not disclose how much influence that licensee did or did not have over their own business affairs um, a tendency not to disclose your business model or whatever it is and that's not the fault of advisors by and large that's simply the way the AFSL regime uh, operates and the way that larger businesses came in to you know work around that uh, that AFSL regime in the form of you know business dealer groups um, so I do think there was a disclosure problem. I think the problem is government instead decided to outlaw a particular business model rather than require people to be more upfront about the business model they're operating under. And all we've done as a result is pushed a whole lot of Australians out of advice. Um, and so I worry that, you know, there are some really innovative stuff that financial advisors are doing, but increasingly the ones who are doing those things are moving more to a high net worth client base. Um, which is a perfectly legitimate thing for an advice firm to do. But as a society, it's not solving the problem of mums and dads needing financial advice and not being able to afford it. So certainly I think um, a focus on disclosure, on being upfront, would be really helpful um, for the industry and would stop uh, misguided legislation down the track if, if we embrace that. Um, but more importantly for advisors, it's not just about disclosure because you have to be compliant with the law. It's about value proposition. Uh, and it's about owning what it is that you specialise in um, rather than sort of, you know, succumbing to, to, to what the government says a financial advisor is and must be. Yeah. And do you think, though, like, we, because we spent a, a bit of time chatting about, I suppose, the, the compliance obligations and how to uh, reduce some potential issues, do you think more disclosure is the answer? Because it seems, you know, the last time we chatted about it, I think we sort of came to the view that, uh, that it, you know, there's so, there's already quite a lot of disclosure, but also it's it's so easy to sort of avoid some of the um, I, I suppose some of the purpose of uh, of some of the legislation that that's been set out via just you know scoping advice and just disclosing it away, and and you know from a consumer's perspective, I suppose it's you know it's challenging to. Uh, to understand what are the you know the important disclosures in the in the the, the massive list of, of disclosures mm. that an advisor provides, what do you see that actually looking like in a way? Do you know? Do you think in its current form additional disclosures, or do you see some some more change needed to to actually have the impact? Well, just on that, I think it would be helpful, for example, for people who have a um, licensing arrangement with a large bank for that to be more clearly disclosed, um, but. Having said all that, I don't think a lot of these problems that disclosure is trying to fix are the fault of financial advisors. You know, mm. The AFSL regime puts liability on the financial advisor. But as I said to you guys, I've met thousands and thousands of Australian financial advisors and the vast, vast majority of them, you know, 95% upwards, I would say, not only do I think that they are acting in their best interest, but I would recommend my family to go and see them. Uh, I, I, I think that they genuinely care about their clients and are doing their best to run good businesses. And in most of the cases where consumers have been ripped off or something bad has occurred, it's either because a product has failed or because a dealer group has decided to control the decision-making of the advisor. Uh, and, and those people are not liable under the regime in the way that financial advisors are. So I think that disclosure, oh, I'm a journalist, I believe in disclosure, the more information, the better, right? Yeah. But I think we're trying to fix the problem that financial advisors didn't create. And I think there's yeah. systemic corruption much further up the chain 
um, that has very little to do with the advisor sitting in the practice who is just trying to comply uh, and service his clients in the best possible way. So, yeah, the disclosure is inherently good, but the problems in this industry are much higher up the chain. Okay. Yeah, interesting take. Uh, I, I'm going to chat to you about what, you, what you're seeing for successful advice businesses in a second, but just for the guys watching in, um, I, I've got a couple more questions for Alex and then Adrian's got a, got a couple as well. But if you guys have got any questions, uh, anything that you'd like to ask Alec, Alex, you can just type them in the chat box on the, on the right-hand side there uh, and we'll, we'll come to them uh, very shortly. Uh, so one of the things, one of the other things that you mentioned before, um, I, and I wanted to ask you, you know, what are the trends, what are you seeing for the most successful advice businesses? What are those guys doing differently? But also you mentioned before, in particular around um, legislation, that there's been a lot of, uh, you know, being reactive to the changes that are happening as well. So I suppose two parts, what are the general trends that you're seeing successful advice businesses do? And what are you seeing businesses do like, to position themselves to, to move away from that being reactive and staying in front of the, the, the sort of the changing tide of, of legislation in financial advice? Sure. Just on the second point, um, you know, it is not a criticism of financial advisors. There simply has been a whole raft of new, as you guys know in your business, there's a raft of new stuff and you've got to spend time and resources adapting to those systems. And so that's been a reality and, and there's been no choice there. Um, yeah. I do think that with some of the exciting reg tech, uh, which is a fancy new word that's going around, but basically, you know, compliance focused fintech solutions, um, yeah. a lot of that's really booming in the States. I think some of it, uh, hopefully a lot of it will come here if our regulator uh, allows it to. Um, and I think that utilizing some of these uh, automation tools um, can, can help to, to get some of those things off your back. Um, we've got the IFA Business Strategy Day Roadshow coming up soon and one of the sessions there will be about using you know kind of the, the latest innovations to minimize that client group that compliance gorilla get it off your back so that you can focus on more important things so i think there are increasingly things you can do to minimize that burden um, separately for those advisors who are interested i still think there's an argument that they should go out there and try and stop this regulation happening in the first place and they should fight for their rights as business owners to make their own decisions um, when I see far too much at the moment, the financial advice associations, the industry associations or professional associations, as they now term themselves, um, uh, not trying to do that, but instead embracing what the government is trying to do and helping them enact their spin. So, you know, I think separately, advisors who are angry about this stuff, I still think there's a fight to be had. Uh, and as business owners, I think they're better equipped to make these decisions very often than bureaucrats or politicians. Um, Putting all of that to, to one side, just in terms of some of the trends I'm seeing uh, that good firms are doing well. You know, embrace of technology is not an optional one. Uh, and it's not about being you know, innovative or disruptive, um, you know, just like what the, the banner behind me may say. It's about uh, you know, trying to create efficiencies in your business so that you can spend more time with clients or service a greater number of clients and really you know, get that scale happening in your business. Um, yeah. The other trend that I'm seeing that is starting to happen here slowly, and it is part of the move away from a commissions-based system, but um, I think there's a cultural thing in America where there's a real honesty to the sales process sometimes. They're very confident generally in American business and, and small business people too. And as a result of that, I saw a lot of very successful firms um, uh, really honing in on their value proposition uh, and selling that. And it was a really niche proposition. So, for example, I met one guy who's got, who's, he's got an RIA firm, so the equivalent of a non-aligned licensee or independent firm. Uh, it's gone from, you know, a very small practice to being tens of billions of dollars. Um, and he said the secret to his success was actually looping the consumer into the parts that he wasn't doing. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, we got to the point where we realized we weren't actually managing the money. We were managing the clients. We were outsourcing the management of the money to mutual fund, managed fund providers, we weren't, or ETF providers, but we weren't telling the consumer that necessarily. And he switched up his mode, and this won't be right for all firms because some firms uh, you know, are investment management based. But he said, hey, you know, I, I don't run the money. Steve runs the money. He cares about quantity of easing in Japan. I don't, I care about you, right? And yeah. so there, there's been this real movement in the States, uh, the financial life management movement, which has really seen people focus in on their client and be more upfront about the relationships that they have with product providers 
and we're now seeing success come from that. Um, I'm also seeing, uh, and, and as the managing editor of IFA, some people might say that I'm you know, tooting our own horn here, but I am seeing the growth of independence uh, across a number of countries to be a movement. Um, yeah. and, and that is because largely the global financial crisis exposed some of these relationships um, the traditional safety that you feel with, with financial institutions or the consumers feel, um, a lot of that has been uh, damaged. And so I think there's a free marketing kick now in being independent of all that. Um, and, and, and really that idea of being able to make your own decisions uh, and work in your client's best interest. So that's certainly a trend that is underway now. If you can operate in an institutional dealer group and still make all your decisions, then totally fine. You know, you, then, then there's, no, there's no issue. This is not about politics. It's about can you, as a business owner, make your own decisions? And if you can't, you've got to get out and get into a situation where you're making your own shots. Okay, interesting take. Adrian might have some some thoughts on that when we when we get to him, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. I'll leave that. <laughs> we can talk off record about that lady and Adrian. Uh, <laughs> um, look, last question from me, Alex. Before I turn it over to Adrian and the questions from the guys watching in, what are the biggest pain points that you're seeing? For advisors, mm. yeah. Look, I, I still think that um, the compliance thing is number one. Um, I also think that there uh, that is the biggest one, and the other one is um, just dealer groups in general. I mean, I that constant back, the amount of practices that I speak to that are locked in constant negotiation with their licensee over simple things like use of technology or branding of their website or choice of, of, of product. And we've almost gotten to the point where financial advisors are just used to being told what to do by people who are meant to be service providers to them. And that's yeah. the great irony of the AFSL regime. I mean, people act like they're owned by their dealer groups. In some cases, they, they are. But that's a very small minority. Most are paying for the privilege of being told what they can and cannot do. Um, and I think that's taking an enormous amount of, and I understand it from the licensee perspective, you know, the licensing game, unless you're pushing product, is not a very profitable game to be in. So they're trying to, you know, generate returns for their shareholders too. And there's nothing evil here. But the, but the issue is that, you know, advisors are realising that they need to be in control uh, and they're wasting a lot of time trying to steal back their control. And that's time they could spend with their clients or spend on marketing or spend on growth. Yeah. Yeah, look, I'd, I would definitely agree with that. I know for me, I certainly see dealer groups as they, they are a service provider to the clients, but I'd agree that, you know, often it, that can get, uh, can get confused. Mm -hmm. And I think um, a similar trend I'm seeing uh, with technology providers, you know, there are some great emerging fintech providers. We're going to be honouring some of them at the Fintech Business Awards uh, coming up in February. But, you know, they are growing. This movement is growing in terms of there being a community, a, a large supermarket of different fintech providers to choose from. Um, but I see another pain point, and I think to a certain extent it can be self-inflicted by the advisor. There's a tendency to identify what you want, but then to request it of your, your single, you know, technology provider. They want everything to be um, within one software platform, for example. And I understand that from a convenience point of view. But yeah. the reality is that the way the technology is going with open APIs and so on um, is a lot of different pieces of technology are talking to each other and sharing data in, in really interesting ways. And so um, I think for advisors to really maximise this fintech opportunity, they need to be going to the tech providers. Well, first, they need to be going to their licensee and saying, I want to make my own decisions on this. Otherwise, they've got to go. Secondly, they should be saying to the technology providers, this is what I want. Um, and this is what we need in our practice, and you have to provide it to me. Uh, and I think, you know, as I said, financial advisors are consumers, and they're important consumers because they control, to a certain extent, the retirement savings of, of, of mums and dads. Not enough mums and dads, but the lucky ones who are getting advice. Uh, yeah. And so I think that they need to realise they're consumers and start leveraging a little bit more consumer power um, over licensees and over technology providers, over all of their service providers. That's something that I see American financial advisors doing without any shyness. Um, and uh, anyone who's spent time there, that, that won't come as a surprise. But I think that would be helpful for a lot of my readers, definitely. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. Ben, are you, how are you doing there? Have you, have you yeah, finished? I did, I did have more, but, uh, but I'll, t I'll turn it over and um, 
if I get time, I'll, I'll come back at the end. Well, Alex mentioned, uh, yeah, the delicate relationships that everyone has with their dealer groups from time to time and um, the, t the p tug and uh, play that happens when uh, you're trying to do certain things new in your business and, and the limitations that can come through. And yeah, I, I, uh, I can definitely vouch for him on that one. Um, the question I really ha wanted to know is like, fast forward five years, Alex, like we're, we're dealing with all this pain at the moment. Um, and everything is uh, a bit uh, up in the air with technology, with regulation, with what's happening. What is the advice, an advice practice going to look like in five years' time? What do you What do you really think with what you've seen in the US, with what you know what's happening in Australia? What's an Australian advice practice going to look like? Yeah, interesting. Look, I think um, it's going to look more and more like the ones that are not feeling a whole lot of pain right now. Um, uh, uh, but for others, unfortunately, they may be have to they may be phased out. So. I think it will look different. There will be this um, kind of, uh, you know, parting of the Red Sea where some will be forced out by the amount of regulation that's there uh, and where it's going. And particularly, um, we don't know exactly where we're going to end up on the risk advice commissions thing. But for many businesses uh, within my readership, uh, you know, that's going to be, you know, very important in terms of uh, their survival and their long-term plans. Uh, but I think that increasingly you will see um, advice practices that are, Definitely um, more digital, uh, you know, definitely uh, thinking about scale and presence of the advisor in different ways, uh, in the way that we are in different industries, such as fitness. Um, and I think that, you know, we will, I, I think the value of advice is only going to get stronger and stronger and stronger for those that are honing in on the value proposition. Um, and we see this because we see more and more people getting, uh, you know, personal trainers. We see more and more people having life coaches. We see more and more people having these sorts of lifestyle advisors. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, shrinks are also, you know, it's, it's an industry that's not going anywhere. On the flip side, I think where the real pressure is, is not on the financial advisor, but on the fund manager. Because increasingly, and there are many, many good fund managers out there in Australia, no doubt. But if your value proposition is in managing money, you have got to compete against the robot. Uh, and the robot is only going to get better and better at managing money, particularly uh, in a non-active sense. Um, but for financial advisors who have that deep relationship, that's never going to be something that is not of value to human beings. Um, the ones that, that do very well in the future are going to be the ones that know that, um, that are honest about it, and that charge for it accordingly. Uh, now, my, my issue is I don't know what that means at the lower balance end of the spectrum. Hopefully we can find technological solutions using robo advice um, and, and, and there becomes a lucrative business model for young people, for people who aren't on high incomes and that, you know, you guys, financial advisors, licensed financial advisors, get to be part of that because otherwise it's going to be completely left just to intra-fund advice in the industry funds um, and, you know, arguably there are political forces wanting that to be the case. Um, but I think there needs to be choice for consumers um, and, um, you know, so financial advisors of the future, I think, will be more independent, calling their own shots and really focusing on that client engagement first and foremost. <coughs> they always have done that to a certain extent. But I think if your value proposition is tied up in investment management, then all power to you, but you've got to be bloody good. Fair enough. So with um, another another one I've got is, so we, we're doing with 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 all the commentary you've had recently, um, you had two, you've got two things you can do, two, two sweeping changes in the industry. And it can just, you can do whatever you want. It can be regulatory, it can be um, licensees. What would they be uh, to get the outcome that you think the industry should be um, working towards uh, for the consumer? Yeah, it's tough. I've never been given this opportunity to just get a text up and just go at the Corporations Act the way that I'd like to. Um, but oh, the Corporations Act is on the table as well. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Let's put it on the table. Look, I think um, it's hard to say. I do think, now if you look at the difference of the regulatory system um, uh, in the United States and in Australia, and, and there's less regulation there, and arguably that's because voters have an appetite for less regulation there that we don't necessarily have here. And so you have to factor that in. But one of the benefits they have to their regulatory system for RIAs, registered investment advisors, those that are basically independents in their language, um, is that they're all individually licensed with the regulator. And then they come together and they can be in any sort of corporate environment that they want. 
because they've got individual accountability and visibility to the equivalent of asset to the SEC, right? So if we can now, I've, I've spoken to a whole bunch of lawyers and there's all sorts of reasons and vested interests and things why this can't happen here right now. Part of it has to do with ASIC's funding model and ASIC having, having an incentive to have fewer licenses, which is one of the reasons, in my view, it's been you know, soft on banks and tough on IFAs because it wishes it only ever had to deal with four lawyers, four licenses, not thousands. Um, but if we could find a way, I, I accept there needs to be regulation. You're not, not just going to get rid of licensing. You know, we have it for florists in Australia. So I think financial advisors are not going to get away with not having licensing. But um, I think if we can find a way for individuals to be accountable to the regulator, then we can start to think about interesting ways of coming together in corporate groups, like a, like a partner system in a law firm, for example, um, that, um, that where, where you don't get those conflicts that you get in the AFSL dealer group regime where you're paying for a license and then they're also taking away some of your rights to make your own decisions. So um, that would be one of the things, some sort of move towards self-licensing perhaps. Now I say that um, in full knowledge that there are many licensees that I have excellent relationships with who uh, I think are doing good things and trying to innovate and doing you know, the best things for, for their advisors. But the reality is that dealer groups don't exist because of a natural client, a consumer demand. They don't. There's no free market that wants a dealer group. Dealer groups exist because the AFSL regime is set up in a way to make them a necessity unless you're going to become self-licensed, which is very expensive, very expensive on purpose, in my view. So I think some sort of move, whether it's self-licensing or whether it's just some sort of individual accountability that makes ASIC happy, I think if we did that, we can then think about cool kind of conglomerates partnership models, different corporate structures that might allow us to scale. Um, so that would be uh, probably the main one that I that I think of. And, and I also think there are just, the other one is just a cultural thing. And that's for, you know, financial advisors have an embattled mentality right now. And I understand it. You know, they've been going to Canberra for years. Um, they're, they're splits and, and, and all this within associations. And that's partly because um, there are, as I said, all these different kinds of communities. There are risk specialists, there are independents, there are those with an investment expertise and there are those without. Um, and really these are different industries. It's just that there are um, vested interests out there trying to keep you all in one big basket because it's easier for government not to do real consultation, but to deal with just one person. And there's a revenue benefit to the large financial advice associations in keeping you all in the one pile, quite frankly. Um, so I would like to see advisors take more ownership of their own value proposition um, and, and really just, you know, start to realise that they have more purchasing power than um, they're being told. Great, Alex, that certainly answered my question. Love it. Yeah, and, and to follow that on, uh, yeah, it's definitely possible to navigate the current environment and deliver awesome outcomes. Uh, cool. It's just you just got to really uh, apply yourself to it so um, and use yep. everything that, that's available, including technology and new ways of doing things. And uh, the XY Advisor Facebook group is a great place to receive all those hot tips. We've got, um, Ben, I don't know if you're going to jump over to those questions that we've got. We've got a couple of questions there from the audience. Yeah, so we've got, guys, we've got a couple uh, of, of um, questions from the audience. If anyone else has got any questions for, for, for Alex, feel free to type them in the chat box. We are sort of running a little bit tight on time. But um, first question from, from Dylan Martin, uh, talking about how, you know, we know that the, the take-up rate for financial advice in Australia is quite low. Are you seeing any new trends uh, around the, the uptake of advice for specific life stages in particular, or do you have any any access to uh, you know trends in those er those more you know life stage specific? Yeah, I think um, I know a lot of the big ETF providers in the United States have done a lot of interesting research on this, um, uh, BlackRock and State Street and so on, Vanguard, um, uh, and I am seeing uh, over there at least slightly more take up in the Gen Y, Gen X bracket. Um, but I think that's because uh, financial advisors over there have made that a priority. Um, and so uh, they, you, they, they all talk about the generational wealth transfer. Uh, and that's like the main buzz term that you hear. Everyone's focused over there on how do you build a 30 year uh, uh, you know, base of clients? How are you gonna get, once the baby boomers retire, how are you gonna get their kids in? Um, and I feel like, 
that conversation is occupying the same amount of oxygen and, and, and kind of energy uh, over there as our compliance conversation is having, having here. Um, yeah. And I think so many advice practices would love to focus on a 20-year business plan. But they're too, too busy trying to work out what the legislation is going to be next year and, and how their business model is going to look. Um, so I, um, I, I do think that we will start to see that take up. Um, I, I worry that the legislation as it is makes that difficult to do. Um, I do think there is a role for product commissions uh, inside bank branches, as long as consumers know what they're getting. Um, you know, people need financial products and people need small scale financial advice. Uh, and there needs to be an ability for that to happen. Uh, it's not gonna happen under the current legislation. So I think, um, you know, it, it is a problem getting more people in, but I also think um, there are things we can do. It, uh, you know, if we try and create some cost efficiencies, then we can focus on bringing more clients into the door in the first place. And that includes clients of all ages. Um, uh, I'm also seeing a lot of people using robo advice within their own websites. So they'll say to their 60 year old clients, um, you know, we've got this new tool for uh, your kids, you know, bring them on there. We'll sign them up to some index funds and we'll, and, and we'll get them thinking about their finances. And I think there are tools out there, digital advice solutions that you can increasingly use to focus on, bringing in that next generation. I think that's going to be important. Um, but I also think obviously um, there still is work to be done on the um, perception of the industry, which is stopping some people. Um, and, and I do think, I think it's a misnomer that the majority of people have a negative view of financial advisors. Certainly they have a worse view of journalists, perhaps understandably. Um, but they, I think the number one misperception about financial advisors is that they are only for rich people. Not that they're crooks or that you shouldn't trust them, but that it's not for me. Yes. Uh, and unfortunately, I think we've got politicians and industry associations who are helping us move towards that instead of trying to work out how we can service everybody. Um, yeah. So I, I totally am hearing that as a pain point. I feel for advisors that are looking to bring different demographics in the door and struggling to do that. Uh, insurance has traditionally been a way that advisors can service those families. Um, uh, and if that becomes more difficult for advisors to do profitably, then, um, you know, there'll be additional pain there. But um, certainly, you know, I'd encourage advisors to look at the technology that's out there to keep researching. I know that's a cost on your business just to, you know, be doing that stuff. But, but there is providers out there that can help you do this stuff. Um, the IFA Business Strategy Day Roadshow this year is going to be focusing specifically on that. How can we create more profitable businesses? How can you sell your value proposition? It's stuff that you're not hearing at most association uh, conferences. Uh, so we're going to be in Melbourne on the 2nd of March, Brisbane on the 3rd, Sydney on the 7th, Perth on the 9th. So I've got to get that plug in there, businessstrategyday.com.au. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> nice. Look, just to, just to follow up and very subtle um, placement of that, by the way, um, but I think that just to your point on, you know, seeing younger demographics taking up advice and that coming out of the US, I, personally, I think that that's partly, or they, they've, they've got more time to focus on it with less less uh, compliance sort of obstacles in their way. But I've done a lot of uh, reading on, on this sort of area and I've I found that the generational mindset I, I've, uh, actually drives the Gen Ys more to saying that they need help in particular areas, whereas if you look at it, you know, Gen X uh, and the boomers as well, they more think that they should, can and should be able to do it themselves. Um, so I think that's a factor, that's a factor yeah. to play in as well. I totally agree. I mean, you know, I think our generation um, uh, wants financial advice. They're certainly thinking more about finances than our parents' generation was when they were our age. Yeah. Um, and so I think that we, um, I think there is a huge opportunity there. We just need to ensure that it's profitable um, uh, because, uh, frankly, that's important for, for the industry to grow and to be more vibrant. There needs to be profit. Yeah, and do you think commission is the answer to that, though? Like you mentioned before, that you, you see that that's got a, got a role to play. Do you think that's the only way that people can work in these demographics? Uh, no, no look, I don't think it's the only way. I just think taking that off the table was not the right answer to the problem. Um, uh, but I think there are all sorts of ways, um, uh, and, and I think that, you know, it's, it's about automation, I think, increasingly and, and working out what bits can be outsourced, what bits can be automated by the robot and what bits cannot. 
And I yeah. think at the moment, there's still a lot of uh, practices are spending a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with their mo most valuable assets, which is, you know, their practice principles and their senior advisors. Um, I think increasingly there'll be ways that you can utilize your support staff, um, your, your less experienced staff in scalable ways. Um, uh, and, and, and these sorts of ideas are starting to come to the fore. Um, so, yeah, I agree. I think there's a great opportunity in younger clients, um, but it, it's not front of mind just yet. Yep, agreed. Well, Alex, uh, just in finishing, one last question. Um, would you ever become a financial advisor? And if you, if you would, uh, how would you do it and who would you focus on and what would you do? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, no, I would not. I, um, I feel like I'm, I know enough about the... Are you saying we're mugs? Pardon? He's He's all <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think your, your your financial knowledge is simply better than my own. Anyone who's seen my bank statements um, will know that I'm in no position to be giving financial advice to anyone. Um, uh, so, look, I think we all have a role to play. Um, mine is in, in hopefully um, helping to form these new communities that are emerging, uh, provide information that's going to help advisors grow better businesses and ultimately get information out there to consumers that will help them make uh, right choices. So I have enormous respect for what you guys do. Um, I'm not sure that I would uh, go, would do the same. Um, if, if I was to do it, and when people come to me and say they're thinking about that, I, I tell them to think long and hard about their licensing decision, uh, whether to self-license. And if you're not self-licensing, then be very sure about the people that you're doing business with, because there are groups out there who want you to succeed, and there are groups out there who frankly do not care. Uh, and, and so I think that, um, you know, that's a really important first decision that I would make if I was becoming a financial advisor. But I think um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to you guys and I'll, I'll just keep, uh, you know, putting information out there and doing what I do. It would be a great loss. Job with Alex. <laughs> would be a great loss to the industry if we didn't have you there uh, taking the fight to the big guys for us. Very kind, mate. No. Cool, guys. Well, look, thank you very much for joining us today, Alex. Uh, it's been great to have you on. I feel like a very fitting way to kick off the year. Uh, apologies again uh, to the guys, and thanks for bearing with us through our technical issues at the start. Um, we're coming back to you next Thursday, same time. We're going to be running these XY Lives weekly. Uh, thanks again to the guys at AIA for, uh, for making all this happen, uh, and look forward to catching you guys next week. Thanks, guys. Next time I'll interview you. <laughs> no, yeah, you're on. You're on. Yes. Alex, see you guys. See you guys. Peace out. Thank you.